So next up is, um, let's see, vineyard ants identification and their role in IPM. Jill Oberski, she's a PhD candidate in Phil Ward's Ant Lab at the Department of, um, of Entomology and Nematology at UC Davis. And we can get Jill to unmute yourself and share your screen. Great, can you hear me? Yes. And can you see my slides? Yes. Beautiful. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to talk to you all today about vineyard ants and their role in IPM. So for my PhD at UC Davis, I'm studying ant evolution and biogeography. So I'm not an expert in IPM, uh, just an expert in ants. But uh, I can tell you a whole lot about ants. So let's get started. Ants are so diverse, way more diverse than people realize when they just see them on the ground with the naked eye. Um, what intrigues me the most is their diversity. So here we have an ant on top of another ant. The size difference is ridiculous. Uh, they come in all sorts of sizes and crazy colors, and there are an estimated 20,000 species of ants, including hundreds in California alone. So, some of the other ways in which ants are diverse are in their nest sites. Some of them nest in the ground, some of them only nest in trees. Um, some of them have huge colonies or restrict their entire colony to the inside of a single acorn. Um, their diet and ecology are similarly, like if the animal kingdom is doing it, ants are doing it. Uh, so there are ants that are predators like army ants. Lots of ants are scavengers. And some ants are even farmers that do things like grow their own fungus or watch over their flocks of aphids um, or other hemipterans. Because they're social insects that live in colonies and have a social structure to their societies, that's really opened up a lot of uh, diversification possibilities. And because of their many uh, dietary needs, they perform a lot of important ecosystem services like um, uh, helping break down fallen trees and countless other things, but that's not what we're here to talk about. So as it relates to IPM, what matters is that there's very little that you can say about ants in general. Um, there are some morphological details that apply to all ants and they live in colonies, um, i.e. groups and or nests, um, but even the social structure varies a lot. So I studied diversity and how it's the result of evolution, but it's this diversity, specifically differences in ecology and life history and behavior and so on, that are extremely important if you're encountering ant pests and you need to control them. So ants themselves actually cause no harm to crops and plants, but they have these mutualisms with hemipterans, um, mealybug scales, aphids, leafhoppers, lots of different hemipterans, um, the true bugs of the insect world. And they, they tend them and protect them like a, a little herd of sheep or something. And in return, uh, the bugs secrete uh, sugary excretions called honeydew and the ants uh, eat and drink that sugary honeydew. Um, so because of this, even though ants don't cause crop damage, they can seriously interfere with biological control because they're defending these hemipterans from other threats they might encounter. It's also difficult to, uh, they're intimidating to control because you have to target a colony rather than an individual. Um, ants are sort of super organisms that are thousands of individuals rather than, uh, you know, a single one, but they act as one individual. So any pesticide has to reach the reproducing queen in the nest to be any good. Ants pass food to each other through this process called trophallaxis. So luckily, um, not every single ant has to visit a bait to be targeted. Anyway, we need to identify ants because uh, they show a variety of dietary preferences. Um, Aim one, we want to target the pest, but aim two, we want to reduce impact on other species. So if we can tailor it to the exact dietary needs, that uh, reduces the risk for all of the other species in the environment. 
So first thing first, if you are in the field, make sure you take some basic observations. Do they form foraging trails? Do they have a visible nest? Are they tending hemipterans? Um, and then the question is, how do you identify it? Not all ants look the same, not under a microscope. A lot of ants are little and brown, but a microscope is going to be your friend. So um, let's talk about how to identify ants because that's my specialty. So collect your ants, kill them, and then it's time to view their little features. Um, it's possible that you can observe some of the features with a hand lens and just holding the ants in forceps, um, but that's difficult even for me. So I would highly advise you to use a microscope and point mount your ants. Um, this will be easier to view them from different angles and whatever you do, don't push a pin through an ant because it'll destroy the very features that you are trying to see. So just glue it to a little piece of paper, stick a pin through it. Um, and then it'll be easy to manipulate under the scope. The main parts of the body we're gonna be talking about are the head, thorax, pediole, and gaster. Um, the pediole is this little waist that's uh, unique to the hymenoptera, ants, bees, and wasps. And uh, thorax and gaster are not scientifically accurate, evolutionarily accurate names, um, but for simplicity and uh, consistency with all of the IPM resources out there, I'll call these head, thorax, pediole, and gaster. There are a couple of identification keys I've found to vineyard ants on the IPM websites. Um, the one that I really want to emphasize is the one put together by Monica Cooper and Lucia Varela. Um, vineyard ants specifically, it includes some really awesome field guide information, such as if they form foraging trails. So once you have an ID, it'll give you a description and then you can match your ants to that description and compare them. Uh, there's also a key to citrus ants, which includes four species, not in the Cooper and Varela key. Um, so I wanna point that one out as well. Um, I also found one for household ants, but it's not particularly detailed. Um, and it only includes one species, not in the other keys. So all of these keys, uh, it must be stated, do not include every single ant that you might encounter in a vineyard. Um, these keys to vineyard ants are only for the pest species, basically, because California is home to many, 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 many ant species. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with using identification keys, just really quick, um, you don't need to visit every question in order. You follow the directions in the key, um, leaping to either the next criterion or the ID of the ant. So starting at number one, it says go to two or go to five. So let's go to two, it says go to three, we go to three, it says go to four, and so on and so on until you reach a, a clue that yields a diagnosis, like here on the lower right, the carpenter ant. So um, walking through the Cooper and Varela key, step by step here um, to help you through your future identifications. First step is looking for the pediole. The pediole can have one node or two. So here on the left, we see blue for a single pediole. Um, which can also be hidden sometimes. If there's no clear pediole, there's just a single node on the pediole. But uh, other ants have two nodes on the pediole, meaning they have a pediole and a post pediole. And it's pretty obvious if they have two nodes, they have a very long, skinny waist. And if they have a post pediole, they also have a sting. So if you can see a sting, that'll help clue you into that as well. The second step on this key is uh, the tip of the abdomen. So for ants with a single node, um, the tip of the abdomen might have a circle of small hairs or no circle of small hair. So uh, the circle of hairs here is called the acidopore and this subfamily Formicinae that has this acidopore ha um, has ants with a circular anus, a very obvious anus and a little 
a, a, like a starburst of hairs around it that helps sprays formic acid. Um, and then oftentimes with the hidden and flat pediol, you will see there's no acidopore whatsoever. Uh, there's just smooth cuticle around the, the abdomen of the ant. The third clue here is the shape of the thorax. So the thorax in formica ants, for example, is uneven. There's this dip here um, halfway down the thorax. And in Campanotus, uh, they have these really smooth rounded humpbacks. So I've included some uh, photos of each of these ants too. And you can see that uh, in formica, it's almost a peanut-shaped thorax, um, whereas in Campanotus, there's a, a, yes, it's a very smooth curve, even if there's a suture, it's a, yeah, unbroken line. So you can see that both of these ants also have a single pediol, one that's very obvious. The next informative feature is the length of the antennae. So the Formica species I was just talking about has very short antennae, um, whereas other formicines uh, have antennae far longer than the length of the head, such as Prenolepis. So the important thing to look at here is the, the scape of the antenna, this long segment, um, because ants have elbowed antennae um, we're not assessing the length of the entire antenna here, just the length of the antennal scape. And uh, if you have a prenolepis with these very long antennae, prenolepis will also have a very shiny pointy gaster. Um, it's very plump and shiny and uh, I can always tell prenolepis just um, with the naked eye in the field because they have very shiny pointy gasters. The next clue is for dorsal spines and antennal segments. So there are a couple of features all rolled into one in this clue. Um, the looking at the dorsal side of the thorax, there may be some spines or not. So for this one here on the left, this is a cardiocondyla species. You can see there's a, a pair of spines right here on the back the posterior end of the thorax and um, each of these ants has two pedial nodes, a pedial and a post pedial. Um, along with the spines come 12 segmented antennae, um, including the scape, the long segment. So when you're counting antennal segments, um, count every segment including the scape and between those two clues, um, you can usually get one or the other, if not both. The alternative is that there are no spines on the thorax and the antennae only have 10 segments, um, meaning that you've ended up with a solenopsis, uh, which is a southern fire ant. Next up, the key directs us to look at the underside of the head, or what I like to call the neck beard. Um, there's this structure in harvester ants called a samophore, um, which is a, a basket of hairs on the underside of the head used to help carry sand and other objects. Um, and it's pretty obvious if it's there. You can see the blonde neck beard on this Pagonomermax ant here. Um, so hopefully this one will be uh, an easy criterion to assess. Number seven is the overall hairiness of the ant. So looking at the head and the thorax of the ant, does it have a lot of hairs or does it have very few hairs? On the left here, I think this is a tetramorium, um, whereas on the right here is cardiocondyla. So all ants have some hairs on them, but um, it's, it's pretty evident which ones count as hairy.
finally, um, we've got structure and shape. So with Tetramorium, uh, labeled in this key as species E, uh, Tetramorium immigrans, we have lots of really beautiful sculpturing, um, hairs and things all over, lots of little furrows, and the thorax has a rounded profile um, with those little spines. Uh, the alternative being uh, Fidoli's head, which is very smooth and glossy and shiny. Um, you can tell that it doesn't have any of the texture that Tetramorium has. And uh, there's a big groove here. Um, it's called the metanodal groove on the thorax of the ant. Um, it has those little spines as well, but because of this groove uh, and the smooth head, we can tell it's a Fidoli California. So now that we've identified our ants, how do we make use of this info? Once things are identified, we can identify their diet and bait them much more effectively. Um, emphasis here on baits, not sprays, because sprays aren't going to do much good for the whole nest. Um, baits allow ants to take the, the pesticide back to their nest and share it with their sisters and the queen. Um, and the baits can be targeted to specific species of ants. Some ants are generalists, but some ants only uh, eat sugary baits, um, specifically ants that uh, tend hemipterans for their sugary honeydew are likely to go for sugary baits. Um, two of these species, majorly important species, that uh, tend hemipterans are native gray ants called uh, formica. They are also known as field ants. Um, this is why taxonomists are anti-common name um, because they have five different common names, but typically this refers to formica species. And the biggest problem of all in California and especially the, the coast and wine growing regions uh, are invasive Argentine ants. Um, they come from Argentina, as the name suggests, but they've really, really taken off in the Bay Area and California at large because they, um, well, a couple of reasons. First of all, they uh, get along very well in human altered environments. Uh, secondly, they form uh, what we call super colonies. Basically, instead of one colony existing as a queen and workers that answer to that queen, um, Argentine ants don't recognize that other colonies are other colonies. Basically, anything that is the same species uh, is recognized as if they were nestmates. So this is a gigantic problem here on the West Coast because Argentine ants have many colonies, but they act as one humongous super colony, super organism. Um, and this is a particularly gnarly problem for pest management, as you can imagine, but maybe a slight advantage to this super colony structure um, is that worker ants might bring the pesticide back to multiple queens and multiple nests. Um, maybe getting more bang for your buck because ants uh, at a single bait can bring things back to multiple queens. Um, there was a great review article on this in 2008, um, put together by Monica Cooper, Kent Don, many other folks, including my colleague Neil Tsutsui at UC Berkeley, who's an Argentine ant expert. Um, this article talks about a lot of awesome liquid bait techniques that use the ants biology against them, uh, good bait station design and more. Um, I would like to cordially invite you to look up this article. Uh, it is more than I know about pest control specifically. Um, but yeah, lots and lots of good stuff in there. So 
In closing, social insects can be really pesky because they're difficult to target. There are so many different moving parts in a super organism or with Argentine ants, even a super colony. Um, ants are far more diverse than you might think. And uh, hopefully walking through some of the identification resources and morphological features of ants uh, has you feeling a little better equipped to identify your vineyard ants on your own. And I'm happy to send you these slides and help identify ants that you can't place in the key because there are definitely ants in California that haven't made it into the vineyard keys. Um, also, as a taxonomist, it pains me to say, here are a couple of incomplete keys. So now I have this itch to create uh, a more comprehensive key that might be more useful for everybody. Um, regardless, feel free to contact me uh, if you want to stay uh, in touch about any of those resources, um, existing and future. So thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jill. That was very informative. I hear you when I look at the keys. I remember telling you about them and saying, okay, they're not complete. <laughs> they're meant just for what they're likely to find in the field. Um, so I, I too use multiple keys when, when I'm given samples to make sure I'm not misdiagnosing what I'm looking at um, because mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not in one key but another. Um, so I did post the keys in English and in Spanish in the chat box for anyone that would like to download them um, and see how you can walk through those keys. Um, so Michelle is going to pop on and um, we have some questions for you in the chat box. Yeah, so um, the first question that I think is for you is how deep in the ground will colonies go? That's a great question. Uh, I wonder if I have a slide to illustrate that. Oh, it's not one I dropped into this uh, particular presentation. Um, the short answer is it depends a lot on the ant. The uh, more detailed answer is that some of them um, nest within the first foot of soil. Um, assuming these are ground nesting ants that we're talking about. Plenty of ants don't live in the ground. Um, some of them live in the first foot or so of soil. Some of them have a few chambers at the surface and then a tunnel down, and then a couple more chambers, and then a tunnel down, and then a couple more chambers. They can be 10 feet deep, absolutely. Um, they're amazing little architects. And then I skipped over this, this question, um, but I, I want to make sure that I, I get it to you. Uh, this uh, person says, I have a problem with ants and succulent crops. How can they be controlled? What bait product is used? Does dichotomous earth work for ant control? Diatomaceous. Sorry. No worries. Um, well, that's a good question. Um, how can ants and succulent crops be controlled? I can't tell you much based on succulent crops. I can only tell you things based on the species of ant. So first things first, make sure you identify your ants. Um, but more generally, diatomaceous earth does work for ant control. The problem is that it um, does not only target the things that are being pesky. It targets really every insect. It gets into their respiratory systems and just shreds them. Um, so we see it used a lot in household environments, which is great because you don't want anything living in your house. Uh, but for using things out in the field, I can't say I would recommend it. Um, and then bait products. I, I don't know much about ant bait products. Well, like you said, Jill, the first step is um, identifying the ants so then you can choose a proper bait. Exactly. Because some ants prefer uh, only sugars, some ants prefer only fats, some ants prefer only proteins, and some prefer any combination of all of the above. Um, and then another question, what ant problems are caused in the vineyard? Um, that's a very general question. Ants, well, ants don't cause harm to vineyards by themselves. Um, with the possible exception that vineyards create a good environment for invasive ants because it's a human-mediated environment then. Um, 
the only ant problems in the vineyard that are really serious are ants taking care of other pests that are actively damaging crop yields. For instance, the millibugs, um, they're, they're notorious for attending millibugs. And a huge issue um, here with vine millibug, tending vine millibug, preventing biocontrol from being able to do their job. Um, because of that tending behavior that Jill talked about, um, they will protect the mealybugs from any predators or parasitoids um, and become a major obstacle. Yeah. yeah, I recognize how much of a pest that must be, but on the other hand, I think it's absolutely adorable <laughs> the way that they have these little flocks of sheep and they take care of them and then the, you know, their little farm <laughs> animals give them food. <laughs> Um, it's a really cute little system, a great mutualism, but yeah, one with pretty big consequences. <laughs> okay, is there anyone, any other questions before we move on? Oh, here's another one. I work in an indoor cannabis cultivation facility and we had a broom that became overwhelmed with ants going into the rock wool. I assumed that there were root aphids, but I didn't find any. Hmm. Well, I don't know what rock wool is. Could it be that they wanted water? Definitely. There's some sort of water or food in there. Um, I also had the thought yesterday about phylloxera. I don't think ants have anything to do with phylloxera because uh, they're underground and they don't tend them in any way. But those are other hemipterans in the system that, um, yeah, ants don't actually have a connection to. Thanks. Great. Okay, thank you so much, Jill. That was really um, very exciting to hear you talk about ants. Um,